uh, initiative. Um, today, we're going to um, um, talk about uh, the, so the community-based uh, public health coalitions. Um, our colleague, Steve Greeley, is going to lead this discussion. And uh, I think this is a very important discussion. We've been talking with lots of community-based organizations, and we always wanted this um, coalition to have the characteristics of, of across sectors um, with a strong focus on equity, um, and we have a, a really strong group of community partners here um, that we're going to be involved in. So after these presentations, then there's going to be um, a kind of a group discussion. Um, and then we'll pivot to um, have um, Angie talk a bit about um, our virtual resource network, um, FERN, our FERN network, and our mapping project, and um, um, IP3, which is a group that's doing this initiative for us. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, so with, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Steve Greeley. Steve is the president of Shared Cause, and um, he and his colleagues have led this research, and um, I really think they put together a great panel to, uh, to talk with us today. So with that, I'll stop and mute. Turn it over to Steve. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, we will... Um, I'm going to be presenting on findings of about four months of, of examination of what's happening around the country in terms of community coalitions. And then um, we are very fortunate to have some leaders from the Choose Healthy Life um, initiative uh, join us and they'll be talking about that. And that is Reverend um, David Jefferson from the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, Reverend Jack DeGraff, um, from the Canaan Baptist Church in Harlem. They're both leading this initiative in their respective cities. Um, and Ron Tico, who is the C Chief Operating Officer of Choose Healthy Life. And then we'll also be uh, joined by uh, Marty Miller, uh, who is the former uh, CEO of Ohio, uh, Heart of Ohio Healthcare, and also is a consultant on community engagement for Franklin County um, Public Health in Ohio. And so I'm going to share my screen here and bring up presentation. Move this out of the way here. It's so we've been hearing over the past few years um, about um, how residents in many communities around the country have been coming together to protect themselves from the pandemic and have been organizing themselves um, in ways to do that. And we felt that this could have important implications um, both in overcoming uh, distrust and misinformation um, and also to increase the influence of people that have uh, been historically underserved by our health system. And so we've spent um, the past three and a half months, I guess it's been, uh, trying to learn more about this. And we wanted to understand um, who's, who's helping to drive this um, movement? Um, what has it been working towards? Um, what kind of challenges is the movement encountering? And what does that mean in terms of uh, the needs that it may have? Um, and then from that perspective to um, learn what this alliance might do to be of service. And <clears throat> we wanted to do this in a way we weren't just going to be cataloging activity, we actually wanted to do kind of a deep dive. So we wanted to look at networks um, of, of um, community efforts. Uh, in other words, um, community efforts that are being uh, supported by organizations that are working on a large scale. And so we um, were examining coalitions and initiatives that are uh, spanning multiple states um, that ha had, all, had established uh, their strategies um, that were pursuing results associated with the pandemic and public health equity. Um, and we wanted to identify uh, what kind of approaches um, these initiatives uh, were taking and so, as you can see, we discovered that um, they're coming at this from a, a whole variety of different directions, um, from public health departments, um, from engaging the faith community, 
uh, from using um, data, community generated data to guide action. Uh, we're looking at efforts to um, intentionally engage um, municipal, uh, municipal uh, government with um, nonprofits. Uh, we looked at um, efforts to engage the legal um, system with economic and development and, and health and bring those together. Um, looking at what philanthropy is doing, um, looking at how primary care and that system um, is trying to engage with community and then also looking at um, our um, aging support system that we have nationally and its efforts to build community coalitions. And we have talked, um, these, I'm just gonna quickly show you this, I won't go through it all, um, but these are the, the people that we have talked with. I'll give you a moment to check this out. There's another page too. And what we've been doing is having in-depth conversations uh, with people and pretty open-ended discussions uh, so that people could tell us uh, what they were doing from their own standpoint. And what we've learned is that there is indeed a promising movement underway. Um, there are dozens and dozens of communities around the country that are organizing um, and they're being assisted by organizations that are, are working nationally. And so this is something where there's local focus, but very broad in scope. And we almost universally heard that these initiatives are aiming to grow. Um, they are catalyzed by the pandemic, but in, in addressing the pandemic, um, they wanted to start taking on uh, the issues that contributed to the pandemic's persistence and its unbalanced impact. And so that means that almost all of these initiatives um, aim to move on and continue even as the pandemic recedes, if and when that happens. Um, these initiatives feature cross-sector collaboration and strong resident involvement. And that means that residents are having a, a a significant role in setting the agenda and edu and, um, and making things happen. It's also, I think, worth noting that these are um, efforts that are, I would characterize them as being civic in nature. Um, in other words, um, they're driven outside of government. Now they engage with public health system and the governmental system, but they're being driven um, by the community and as such, they're civic in nature, and, and this is a way of avoiding the politicized um, nature of what's been happening around COVID. And as I said before, there are lead organizations, both nationally and locally, that are providing um, support for them. And that means guidance, information, tools, connections, in some case, cases, money. And the challenges that they're um, experiencing um, are first of all, and this is a major one. Uh, they tell me that uh, the public health system's engagement with community tends to be episodic. So it's responding to say emergencies um, as opposed to being just constant. In other words, um, community collaboration comes in and out of the picture. And um, oftentimes um, this is driven by um, funding. Funding will come in and say, funders come in and say, we need to take on this issue. And so now we're engaging with the community, but meanwhile, there are community uh, conditions that have long been in um, the picture that have not been addressed. As uh, one person um, told me um, in working for a public health department, she'd been hearing, and we've been struggling with diabetes for many years. Now you're coming and you're knocking on our doors for the pandemic. What about the diabetes that's been killing us? And so that contributes to the sense of not having a strong ongoing partnership. Um, and funding contributes to that. Uh, funding oftentimes for community partnership tends to be um, short term. And as, as another person said to me, um, you know, we're taking on issues of lack of equity and racial inequity. Um, it's hard to solve some 
uh, problem that's been around for 300 years with a, a two-year grant. And so um, the funding tends to contribute to this um, difficulty in having an ongoing working relationship. Um, there's a struggle with, with data. Um, we've heard that uh, you know, the idea would be for communities to both be able to generate their own data and disaggregate that data, and have community coalitions have access to that, and also to set the data agenda. So to be tracking things that are important to each community, in addition to having some data elements be in common across communities so that you'd be able to examine things more broadly. And that isn't currently the case. Inadequate funding contributes to inadequate staffing. Uh, we heard that if you want to have um, strong coalitions and partnership, you have to have staffing that's dedicated to manage that. And that um, is not often the case. And the, this work is not um, as recognized as it should be. And lastly, when you're doing leading edge work like this, and there's a lot of innovation going on, um, those that are doing the work um, need, they want guidance. They want to know, are we inventing something on a whole cloth or are there best practices that we can uh, learn from? Are there peers that we can learn from? And so there's a need for that. And that translates into um, these needs. Uh, first of all, this movement is calling out to have the type of recognition that could result um, in um, some sustained funding streams. And particularly funding um, for coalition infrastructure, both local infrastructure, we heard, and national infrastructure to support uh, local coalitions, and also funding to support community-driven strategies. And that's, this is one of the, the biggest things that we heard. Um, we also heard that community coalitions can sometimes struggle to form working relationships with their public health departments and other key institutions. They don't um, sometimes know where to go. Sometimes the entry point is difficult. Um, sometimes it's just difficult to create that relationship. And part of that may be caused because the public health infrastructure itself um, needs to have more resources to be able to manage community engagement. And uh, that infrastructure, as we know, has been underfunded for years. And so uh, sometimes uh, you have people that are managing community collaboration, they have many other responsibilities, or sometimes you don't have positions at all um, focused on that. As we said, there's the importance of having timely data so that communities know where they stand on the issues that they care about, and they need guidance and resources tailored to their needs, um, such as guidance on how you actually have effective partnership. And so when we asked what this alliance might do in support of this movement, um, what we heard was it would be helpful if the Alliance could draw some of the key players together um, to develop a strategy on how to collaborative, collaboratively grow um, this movement. And that could involve, first of all, creating some clarity on what's happening. What is the case for support? What's, what's this all about? Why is it so important? And um, what does it need in order to achieve its potential? Um, we need to advocate uh, to build awareness of that and to actually start building some funding streams for this movement. And also to integrate community collaboration into all of our own work so that it's easier for these um, entities to connect with the public health system. And then lastly, provide some tailored resources uh, that we'll be talking about um, in the next phase of, of today's discussion. Um, and so that's a very quick overview. I'm just going to see if there's any chat. Okay, there we go. So I would first like to start with, with Choose Healthy Life and to um, hear about this initiative that has grown rapidly and had some really significant accomplishment um, in a short period of time, but also accomplishment that um, has far reaching implications um, under the right circumstances. And so uh, 
Ron, would you like to kick this off, Ron Tico? Absolutely, and, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, my name is Ron Tico. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for, for Choose Healthy Life. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm standing in for our founder, uh, Deborah Fraser House. Uh, Deborah, un unfortunately, has, uh, has COVID, tested positive for COVID earlier in the week and is, is still recovering and managing her way through that. And I know that she would have loved to have been here to present. Uh, Deborah is the visionary behind Choose Healthy Life. She is uh, the founder of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS and uh, worked with the Black Church uh, to really fight that epidemic um, over the years. And um, when, uh, when COVID hit, um, she uh, immediately uh, got on the front lines and realized that uh, this was going to be a, a pandemic that was going to disproportionately impact the community. And, um, and, and form Choose Healthy Life. Uh, we're a pending 501c3 nonprofit and um, she brought together leaders in the clergy to address the pandemic um, through the black church uh, in major cities throughout the United States. And so I, I wanted to uh, invite in uh, to join with me uh, two of our, our clergy leaders um, who represent the cities of New York and Newark, New Jersey. Um, Reverend David Jefferson, who is with the Metropolitan Baptist Church, and Reverend Jacques de Graff, our city clergy leader in New York City, who is with Canaan Baptist Church in Harlem. And the two of them have uh, really led our efforts uh, in, those, in those cities. Uh, when we set out um, with Choose Healthy Life, it was very data-driven. Uh, we examined and looked for where testing deserts existed, and we identified uh, five cities and deployed out 50 churches uh, in those cities. We were very fortunate uh, to secure uh, private funding uh, through the Quest Diagnostics Foundation and their Quest for Health Equity program that helped us to be able uh, to put in place a workforce in those areas, and, uh, and that's been really critical to our effort. Um, start off, I, you know, one of the areas that I, you're all too, I'm sure, familiar with is that there, the gap that exists in terms of health equity. Uh, Choose Healthy Life um, short-term focus was on COVID-19, but the vision has always been to establish a health workforce in the Black church uh, to address uh, the health inequities that have existed for so many years. Uh, these statistics that, you know, just came out this past year are pretty evident of those. And as we are continuing to deal and work with COVID-19 in the community, uh, we're also going to be looking forward to uh, our uh, pivot uh, to address uh, health and wellness. And you'll hear more about that a little bit later in, in our presentation. Our model is, uh, again, very much focused on uh, working through trusted messengers in the Black church, our pastors, um, to establish um, a, a level of, of trust and uh, to, to deliver health services. Uh, and that's been extremely um, successful in our efforts over the course of the last year. And we've really been able to deliver very measurable and impactful high impact results in the community. At this juncture, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Reverend DeGraff. Thank you. And I wanna thank the Alliance for having us today because this is a time, a crucial time in our communities. And you know, when we talk about this and talk about it as just health, it seems like it's one dimensional. The reality is that this pandemic has created a crisis in our communities of unprecedented proportions. Uh, domestic violence is up, gun violence is up, alcoholism is up and depression is up. And the churches have, have become the mainstay in our communities because we've bombarded with misinformation, we've been bombarded with controversy. And so people in our communities have turned to the churches and the model that's been created. And Deborah Fraser Howes has created a model. And frankly, when people talk about the black church, too often they're talking about their church, but we are interdenominational. We are geogra geographically spread. We started in five cities that we call legacy cities, Detroit, Atlanta, Newark, DC, and New, New York City. In each of those cities, we had 10 churches. And in those 10 churches, we hired healthcare navigators. We did more than that. We trained them, we educated them, we gave them a program and they helped to create a program unique to each community that they functioned in. 
And so there's a written plan about how we're going to move forward to address not just COVID. And you have to remember when we started out, it was controversial whether people would get tested. It wasn't a government plot. Was it with some insidious plan to undermine us again? And so we had to overcome that. And so people turned to the church where we had these healthcare navigators because in our community, we're a word of mouth community. And so when we want someone that we can go to and see and touch working in tandem with our pastors throughout the city that we are in. In New York, we've got 20 churches now because we've grown from the 50 original churches to 120 churches in 13 states. We share information. We've had convocations. We've had various meetings with Dr. Fauci, the first lady, uh, other health leaders from CDC and beyond so that we could be current uh, with information, but more importantly, the trustworthiness that we've built over the years in fighting for civil rights, in fighting against aid and crack and everything that has besieged our community people turn to us and we're still standing. And so today is an opportunity for us to not only present to you, but to partner with you as we move forward together. Thank you, Reverend DeGraff. And, uh, you know, I think what is the underpinnings of our work and uh, is our National Black Clergy Health Leadership Council, which we are uh, expanding and growing under the guidance of our co-chairs, Reverend Al Sharpton and Reverend Calvin Butts. And as Reverend De uh, DeGraff uh, touched on before, you know, it's our combination of bringing faith and, and science together. And, and uh, our medical advisory board has been very active in helping to keep our, our ministers and our health navigators informed and up to date. Uh, I should, I should be very clear that uh, awareness and education is a key point, but we're actually putting shots in arms, we're testing people, and that's been the primary focus uh, uh, throughout this past year. And we've been very grateful to our advisory board and the roles that they've played in helping and support our effort. And our results to date, and I'm gonna move through these slides relatively quickly. We'll, we'll uh, provide a, a PDF copy that can be circulated for all the participants here today. Uh, but just a, a timeline, today actually marks the one year anniversary from our launch on Martin Luther King Day a year ago. And, and since that launch, um, you know, we've had visits, uh, visits by the uh, first lady to our churches, by the, the vice president. Um, we were able to secure additional funding that allowed us to expand. Um, because we were able to prove out our model early on. Uh, we launched, we had launch events in each of our cities. We received uh, um, almost $11 million from HRSA to expand out and to grow our program, uh, which we've done successfully. Um, and the results speak for themselves. So our education and outreach work in the communities that we serve, we've reached over 16.2 million uh, individuals making sure these are all touch points, whether they received a piece of our literature or electronic distribution, they participated in our town halls that we held locally. Uh, but perhaps uh, most evidence is around the number of individuals that we tested and the number that we vaccinated in the communities. Lastly, a lot of implementation milestones. There's a lot of work that goes behind this. And, you know, from over 1500 meetings, we actually certified and trained our, our health navigators. They went through an important uh, program that they get ongoing education. Uh, we hired and we're supporting that infrastructure uh, to this day. Uh, and a lot is required obviously to maintain that and to sustain it over time. These are a list of all of our churches, you know, in all of the cities that we serve. Um, we're, we're so proud to call them Choose Healthy Life Churches. Uh, and uh, we're, we're excited about um, our, our, our future uh, with those churches and certainly the investment that we intend to make uh, in our legacy cities as we continue moving forward. And I'd like to turn it now over to uh, Reverend Jefferson. You may need to unmute your- Let, let me come off mute. Hey, first of all, let me kind of echo what uh, my colleagues have said and really thank the Alliance. Um, you know, Steve, I was very intrigued about what you said a few minutes ago with respect to, you know, uh, having the necessary funding in order to support and sustain an effort like this. Well, very recently, the CDC confirmed that what we were doing with respect to really you know, touching lives in the community and the work that we've engaged in that Ron and my colleague, Reverend DeGraff have just talked about, 
they confirmed that this effort needed to be sustained and there's certainly a need for us to scale what we are doing. McKinsey did a study uh, for us. Uh, I first met the McKinsey group when uh, my member, Corey Booker, Corey has been a member of my congregation for 23 years. And he and I worked with McKinsey. McKinsey did a study for me about five years ago that said that the black church had 87 to 90% credibility with the constituencies in our community. And as a result of that, uh, it was very important then for other institutions to form strategic alliances with the black church in order to deliver health services and all other types of services. So while our community may have lost confidence in law enforcement, financial institutions, and even our health system, they still trust the black church. And because of that trust factor, what Deborah has basically done, our founder, along with Reverend Butts and Reverend Sharpton, we've all come together then and leverage, if you will, Choose Healthy Life and the Black Church as a major partner in the community with other local health organizations, right, and other institutions so that we can get the work done that we are doing right now. And so we're at a pivotal point now, and that point is sustainability. As Ron eloquently pointed out a few moments ago, we kind of started with shots in the arm, but all along Deborah's vision was holistic wellness and healing. Her vision all along was not just to align with shots in the arm, but to deal with many of the things that was causing some of the underlying conditions that put us behind the eight ball when COVID really hit. For example, we've been doing a lot of testing, a lot of vaccinations, we discovered that we had some 50 plus people the first two weeks we were testing when COVID started, whose blood pressure was very high. We were able to get those folks to the hospital and perhaps prevent a stroke. And so the deal then is, how do we make sure then that this effort is just not COVID driven, but this effort truly represent health and wellness? And along that line, momentum is very critical. Momentum is very important. The starting and the stopping that has been an impediment in our community for years that have really caused a lack of credibility is something that we want to definitely address. We can no longer be episodic. We can no longer be activity driven. We can no longer be event driven. We have to be holistic driven. And therefore, that momentum is critical. Now to maintain that momentum, we are now doing something in Newark on the 25th, the 26th and the 27th, we're gonna have what we call a Choose Healthy Life Weekend, where on that Friday, our mayor and all of the other health organizations in the city headed by Choose Healthy Life is going to declare Newark as a Choose Healthy Life city. So we're gonna go from Choose Healthy Life churches to Choose Healthy Life cities. In addition to that, we are the launch pad. And once we do that here in New Jersey, that, that, that Saturday, we're gonna have something. And then that Sunday, we're gonna have a major service at 915 that will bring, if you will, black doctors together, health professionals together. And that will be the mainstay of my service. That will be ministry where we're gonna educate people, where we're gonna inform people, where we're gonna set the stage that says that this is no longer just about an activity, this is a movement. And that movement is what you hit a few minutes ago. So once we finish then on that Sunday, then we're going to announce, if you will, what we call Choose Healthy Life Days of Hope and Healing in all of the cities that we function in that would really then create the level of momentum that we absolutely need in those cities that Reverend DeGraff spoke about just a few moments ago. So imagine if you will, we've gone from point A all the way to what we're talking about now, and we have an infrastructure that would allow us to do that. And then we move beyond just quote COVID. And now hopefully one of these days, you know, COVID is, is manageable, but we still have everything else that we definitely need to manage as well. And so I really wanna thank you all for the opportunity. 
for us to kind of walk you through the, uh, this today. We're excited about it. I mean, I got to tell you, I've been around quite a while. You know, I was, you know, a top person in AT&T reporting directly to the chairman of the board. We have never had a trained workforce in our churches to do this work like what we have right now. And it has provided a tremendous return. And uh, everyone is excited about continuing this work. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Reverend Jefferson. And Steve, as I hand it back over to you, I just wanted to share, you know, Deborah, our founder, shared with me uh, that uh, everyone keeps asking her, uh, when are we all going to get back to normal? And, you know, her response is, we're not going back to normal. We died in normal. And so we need to really sustain this effort. And we really do appreciate uh, the continued support of, of everyone uh, and everyone on the call. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this is extraordinarily impressive. And um, I think it's very, very clear that um, you have created this remarkable infrastructure that is built on a foundation of trust. And um, it's just incredibly impressive uh, where you are and epitomizes all that we're talking about. And um, now I'd love to, to turn to uh, Marty Miller. It, it, Marty comes at this work uh, from having been the head of a community health center and then being a specialist in community engagement within the public health setting. And Marty, I'd love to hear you just talk us through some of your experiences um, in doing this work, it would be great. Sure, so thanks, Steve. And, um... I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, and be part of this, what I think is a very critical discussion. Um, and um, let me just echo and just say, I'm also hopeful, okay? Because I, I actually, I know you may not think this, but I've been around a long time. <laughs> so, uh, and I don't even want to tell you how many years, okay? Um, and working um, particularly on poor people's issues and and in healthcare and um, diversity and I'm I'm really like over hearing about disparities in healthcare okay and the closing the gap so I think we we do really have an opportunity here to to move forward so I'm very happy Ron to hear that you're um, when you made the comment I think your director was saying you know we died in the pandemic I have no desire to go back. I think we can only go forward and we really need to take advantage of the um, of this the opportunity that we have now. So let me just say, I don't have a lot to add. I think Steve, your presentation and what we just heard with, with Healthy Choice, um, and I just wanna know, you know what I can do about Choose Healthy Life to get it to come to Franklin County in Ohio. You know, I can give you all these reasons offline why I think you need to come on. Okay, so don't hold back. Um, so I'm just going to take about five minutes. I don't have a uh, PowerPoint. We're just going to do um, kind of conversational here with you um, and, and just share a little bit of experience. So to start this with, though, I think it's important, um, just so you know, I do have notes to keep me within my time limit. So I'll be looking down from time to time. Um, but, but just to start with, um, so in my, my experience, um, uh, really community partnerships have, there are layers to it, okay? It's not one dimensional and it certainly is not a one-off situation, okay? So we can engage in something for a one-time kind of thing. That to me is not a real partnership, okay? So I think like, like most things, there's give and take over an extended period of time and we've got to have some kind of shared objective. And if we peel back the layers on this, um, while we were looking at getting people in for testing and certainly for vaccinations and all that with the, with the pandemic, you've already identified here that we had this underlying problem that um, we really needed to get at. And that's because we've had longstanding health disparities, right? So I think that what we have to do is look for those now and build on those intersections and and for public health we've got to kind of come out of the box so to speak and and think more broadly in terms of these kind of relationships 
Um, and we have to forge new pathways from the public health standpoint um, to, to really improve health care. So in Franklin County, let me just tell you, we have a very diverse population here and there are pockets. So it's not just our central city, which a lot of people think about, but we've got a lot of movement, probably uh, some from um, our housing authority, which has helped people to move out into the burbs, so to speak. So this diversity is, is really broad. So large African-American population, um, large growing um, uh, Latinx, which would include um, Puerto Rican as well as Mexican. Those are the two largest groups in the Latinx community. Uh, we've got Nepali, Bhutanese, and we've got any number of African countries represented here. And it just continues to grow. And they've moved out from the central city area for, for the most part into these smaller cities in our county. The smaller cities then, they, they really didn't know quite how to adapt. So we're going through a lot of change here um, in a lot of respects. So let me just say pre-pandemic, the Franklin County Public Health Department had some community uh, relationships um, in place that we could build on to help support efforts around the pandemic. But a lot of times those relationships really just, they just didn't have the depth that was really needed to support. Um, and in other cases, there was just no point of entry at all, uh, particularly in these um, pockets where we had high trending cases of COVID. So we had to create these, right? Uh, so people like me who, who've been around a long time doing this kind of work, um, uh, came on board and we were able to establish those points of entry and 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 hopefully and and let me just say they were not always directly like coming right from me sometimes I had to use that next layer right here's somebody that I know who knows and this person may know somebody right and we built built those relationships that way uh, and what we're hoping is that these will become long-term partnerships so uh, we did use data, by the way, the data that we did have to identify who best in these different um, neighborhoods. Um, so we didn't just look at zip code, but really tried to get down at that neighborhood level would be the best point of, of, of contact. And of course, we needed to go for um, organizations and places of worship, by the way, that had a broad outreach um, so, um, and that outreach in terms of places of worship might not be just with their membership, but the community knew them, right? They service the community. So um, as surprising as it may be to some of you, the, the health department didn't have relationships with the Urban League uh, or our community action agency um, with some of the black Greek um, uh, fraternities and sororities, we, we, we set those up. We have a Columbus network of black physicians. Um, so we, in the, in the housing authority, so we established these, um, these, what I call points of entry for them. And we started building these relationships. And again, we're hoping that these become more long-term uh, over time. They're all trusted, but this is still, we're still at that level where these are what I would call those first layer um, partnerships. So for others, we're, we're, we're kind of working on those. Um, they, they would include, we have an ambassador program here that was developed around the pandemic. And what there we were able to do was identify individuals. Um, they might be elected officials, we have um, clergy, We've got CEOs and we've got others within um, those community-based organizations. We've got businesses. It's a very broad range, neighborhood advocates. But what they all have in common is that they have a degree of influence and they have a social network. So we're able to feed information to them on a regular basis. They help to dispel myths that are out there uh, around the pandemic. Some of them have actually done events around the pandemic um, and they, they've encouraged people to get tested and vaccinated, those kinds of things. 
I think one of the most important things that, that Franklin County has done is they set up an equity advisory committee. So this group, uh, which represents that really broad cross-section of um, residents um, and non-residents in our county, they, they provide really critical direction uh, to, the, to the department and support around these pandemic um, our activities that we have. So they help us to communicate and interact appropriately uh, with each other. Okay, so, you know, when, when there's new um, communications, new assets being developed that we can share out, it, it gets run by the equity advisory committee to make sure that it's on point, that there's nothing offensive, that the message is clear, et cetera, those kinds of things. So I think, I think the bottom line here is, you know, the point is that we've gone from kind of spotty support to potentially a strong foundation for, for this long-term community partnership. Um, but as Steve pointed out, uh, the challenge is that the health department does not have the bandwidth um, to support it. So, so over the next five weeks, that's what we're going through with the health department. Those that have, uh, of us that have been involved with the pandemic and are on as consultants is how do we make this transition? How do we actually uh, get them to a point of the next few weeks that there is some sustainability of this, so that it's not that one-off that we came, we left, we you know we did this much and 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 we left, and really the community is not that much better off because we left because these underlying conditions still exist. So beyond the um, what we heard that 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 the faith community is doing, um, I think there's also a model for this, and that is a lot of the community health centers around the country have been doing this for a while. HRSA required it uh, a few years back to build up community relationships to deal with social determinants of health because they recognized that healthcare was more than just physical health. You've got mental health, um, you've got uh, living conditions of people, you've got earning a decent you know, living wage and all of that. So, uh, let me just say that at Heart of Ohio, when I was there, Heart of Ohio Family Health Centers, that's what we did. We went after community partnerships. Um, and, and I believe they were cr really critical in establishing that foundation for the health center and, and really supporting our operations. So we, um, we went from when I went, which it was fairly new when I went in as CEO, there was about 1,500 patients. Doesn't sound like a lot, but there were about 1,500 individual patients. And then when I left, when I retired, we had over 9,000 patients. So that was in about a six year period to do that. Um, and I mentioned that because this work takes time. It's not something that's done overnight, right? Now today, about three years later, there are more than 14,000 patients. Um, so, and the health center now has actually moved from, we didn't really have any big awards and recognitions in the beginning. Now they're getting recognized. You can go and check their website. They've got recognitions for areas where they, they made extreme improvement in hypertension, um, patients that they're serving, um, and, and, and so forth. So I don't want to belabor that. But the, the point is, they're not doing this work alone. Okay, they have the partnerships, we built the partnerships, put the foundation in place, they built off of that partnership and they're continuing to grow. It's a steady growth. Um, they drive those partnerships deeper. So let me just mention this as a side note with them. One of the things we had were community gardens. These gardens went from, I don't even wanna tell you what they looked like in the beginning and there was probably a handful of them. Um, so in my tenure there, it was more than 26, almost 30 plots. Um, and, and the thing about with the community, it was we noticed that the Nepali community wanted to, to really work those plots the most. And we just established a deeper, stronger relationship through those community gardens, right? So, I mean, so we just have to think, I think, differently um, uh, about this. So, I think I'm about at the end of my five minutes, Steve. Um, 
but I think that that's that's the biggest the biggest thing that we have to tackle now. And and uh, I think it's the coming together of all of us um, together, you know, um, and looking again at these at these intersections and looking at them differently um, to establish that new route to um, to really improving the health status in our communities. Thank you. I mean, I, you really make the point about where things currently stand and, and what can be done to build on established infrastructure and relationships if you're in a position to be truly responsive on an ongoing basis. Now we have some questions uh, from, from the group um, that I'd like to um, share with you. And uh, one is from Ron Bailak about um, the role that the Alliance members might play. And he says, as national organizations, we sometimes can be seen as getting in the way or sometimes sending contradictory messages. Are there any suggestions about how the Alliance um, could be a help to, to these efforts? And I think I'll first um, invite the Choose Healthy Life perspective on that. And if any of you would like to respond. To that. Yeah, absolutely, and I, you know, I uh, will uh, defer to my my colleagues uh, as well on the line here. But uh, uh, clearly, um, you know, at least for us, I mean, the ability for you to be involved and to help us and support us and be advocates for the work that we're doing, um, you know, is, is is something that would be beneficial. You know, it, it's it's almost. I wouldn't call it a seal of approval, but certainly an endorsement that what we're doing is having an impact and is making a difference. And to the extent that you're able to um, help us in that area, serve as a resource from an education and awareness standpoint, I mean, your, your organizations are typically on the front end of knowing what's happening. And a lot of times uh, that information is very slow in getting out into the community and, um, um, you know, that, 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 that we, we have been able to develop a level of um, what I guess I would refer to as, as like a cultural competency that we're delivering. We can take the information that you provide us and then deliver that into the community in a way that it's, it's understood um, and, and through trusted messengers. So that's great. Uh, yeah, thank you. I would, I would just add, I would add to what Ron just said. I think even what you've done today, uh, Steve, is, is very helpful. Um, there are a number of persons who do not understand the Black community, do not understand the Black church, and do not understand how we've always been on the leading edge of addressing significant issues. And so with a network engineering background and finance background that I have, we fundamentally have a network in our communities that is made up of our churches. And you know, those dots are connected and so just an understanding on the part of the Alliance of the Black Church, the network that we have, and as Ron stated out, you know, to help us advocate what we're doing is awesome. The other piece that I would also just add is that you all also have other partnerships with foundations, et cetera. Um, this work that we've embarked upon, it has to be funded. Um, even some of our health institutions, our folks don't necessarily go to the hospital as quickly as they will come to my service on Sunday and get tested and get vaccinated and get boosters because I'm doing that right here in my North X every Sunday. So I'm now handing out kits that are coming from the White House. So those kits that will be coming out, I'll be handing those kits out at my service. And, and so that's where they're gonna come. So at the end of the day, if you connect us with some of those relationships, as a result of the data, as a result of the impact, as a result of the results that we've achieved to date, I think that would be very helpful as well. Thank you. If I, if I could, Reverend Jefferson, there is a, a question in the chat about um, how uh, the churches and the health navigators help with coordinating care. And I, you know, each of our churches have relationships with healthcare providers or healthcare organizations in their respective cities. And uh, Reverend Jefferson, I know you have a strong one, for example, in Newark. Yeah, we, we have uh, a very strong one uh, in St. James Medical Center. And so our strategic alliance with them 
has really just proven results like, like you wouldn't believe. In fact, they are the real partner with me that do the vaccinations, do the testing, the boosting, the whole nine yards. In fact, we go beyond that. You know, we're doing all of the stuff around taking individuals' blood pressure, et cetera. And so on any given Sunday, on any given week, you can see more people come into what we're doing with them than they would go to, I would say, the more formal health, you know, place in, in our city here. Ron, I think I think there's another dimension also is that the role of the church that plays is infrastructure is multiple on multiple dimensions. What do I mean? When we started testing initially, Quest uh, required everyone to have an email address. Everyone in our community is not on the right side of the digital divide. And so when the grandmother who came from a project in our 16 degree day in January got to the church and found out that she had to have an email address, she was ready to put on her coat turn around and go back home. But we got her an email address that day. And so she not only got tested, but she now was empowered to get into the digital generation. And, and, and so this experience is transformative. It's the role that the church has always played. And that is why this partnership, this relationship with the Alliance is so important because you will be in rooms that we won't be in and you can help tell our story and connect us. Thank you. Uh, Donna Grant has, has a question or comment. Yeah, thank you so very much. This has just been um, so rewarding on so many fronts to hear this presentation and the exchange. I, I just want to honor the fact that uh, Black churches have been incredibly important for decades and decades, of course. But the last 30 years, uh, Reverend Jesse Brown from Philadelphia was very instrumental in our tobacco control work and a number of the black churches across the country working in coalitions with the tobacco control coalitions at the time just made such great advancements and really helped transform the, the community partnerships with health departments at the time. And I'm so glad to see the expanded relationships and work that is um, what you all have shared today. And I, 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 I as national organizations, I'll speak for ACP, American College of Preventive Medicine. We have residents in 43 different communities and the physicians in training, the residents um, that we have could partner with you in those communities. So if there's an opportunity for us to get a, a list of where the coalitions are to help bridge some gaps or to make some introductions with our residency programs, I would love to be able to do that. So that's that's one request I have. And then with the relationships with health departments, if the money is funneled from the federal agencies to the health departments at the state level, and then to the county and city levels, that's where some of that flow of money to the community organizations that we in tobacco control programs, I ran the ASSIST program out of the National Cancer Institute, and that's where we had many of the challenges ensuring that the money was passed from one organizational structure to the next in ways that could, could offer some sustainability. But the sustainability of funding has been a, a challenge for over 30 years in my personal professional experience. And I really hope we can find a way to ensure sustainable funding through the future for this COVID, from this COVID experience because of the the important role that you serve and for the community's health. Thank you, Donna, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, we've had a number of questions about the navigator function and how navigators are hired, how they're paid. Uh, could you just give us a little overview of that? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, we work with uh, an implementation partner in each of our cities and uh, uh, for example, in uh, in New York City, we work with the United Way of New York City, and uh, and the funding um, is administered through the United Way, and the United Way then works with providing funding directly to those churches, with the understanding that the the churches will hire those navigators, and uh, the navigators are 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 funded um, and, um, um, and 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 uh, supported. Uh, by uh, training and education program that Reverend DeGraff spoke about that's pretty intense uh, that was developed actually with our 
our initial founding partner, uh, which was Resolve to Save Lives, an organization headed by Dr. Tom Frieden. You all probably know uh, well, and so um, well regarded and has done an excellent job in building out our training protocols. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great program. We, we work with the National Urban League as a implementation partner in some of our locations. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a, it's been you know it's been a wonderful uh, way we we bring them all together for conclaves that we host and um, um, and each week they meet regularly uh, with our implementation partners. And, and let me just add to that they, they are certainly worth their weight in gold. And Donna was saying something a few minutes ago. Uh, you, you cannot sustain this effort on a shoestring. Um, one of the things that United Way did they baseline you know, how do we try and compensate people? Because these people have lives and they have families as well. Um, and so I think that each and every navigator that we have at our local churches, they are the engine around doing the appropriate planning, working with different partners, getting out in the community, promoting the different things that we do and making sure that we can execute, you know, with good solid plans. And so that is the most training that I have seen. And I've been in ministry for a long time. And I'm sure Reverend DeGraff has too. That is the most training that we've invested in in the black church in a long, long, long time. You know, the, 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 in addition to what uh, Doc has just said, one of the things that has been um, critical to the success of this program is fiscal integrity. Uh, it, it, the, the money is not put in his hands or my hands. Uh, they, contracts have, have to be signed. Structures have been put in place to maintain the fiscal integrity so that we can talk about sustainability. Uh, truth be told, when you're doing things, uh, making them, creating them as you're going along, as we did in other struggles, uh, that in, in, in my community, they say things fell off the truck. But, but in this, we do it, we dot our I's and cross the T's because fiscal integrity is at the heart of what we're doing. It, it undergirds the authenticity of the, the church institution. I'd like to wrap up on, on that point uh, because what is really coming through um, this conversation from you and, and from Marty is the importance of solid infrastructure to support this work, both in the community and within the public health system itself in, in public health departments. And that infrastructure um, means, getting there means that this kind of work has to be recognized as being an integral part of the public health system. And then that has to translate into funding streams that will support the infrastructure and ways of working that are based on that. And I think we, we can leave it there for now, but I wanna thank you all um, for joining us and for the, the great questions. Um, uh, this has been uh, a really good session. And I'm gonna turn it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve, for giving us the opportunity to present. And we look forward to following up with you and, and the rest of the organizations that are represented here. And uh, um, we, we've enjoyed our, our alliances and our partnership working together in the past and we look forward to doing the same in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Angie, I'm going to turn this back to you. Can I just say real quick, also, I just really want to say thanks. And, and I think um, just this last note on this point, Steve, is that I do think with the, with the Black church, um, it's, a, it's a great model also, you know, with, with the public health department um, here in Franklin County, I think and this is probably true elsewhere as well. But we've worked with other, we've worked with the Moss you know, and other places of worship. So we really have to look at, in public health, the broad community as well. And they have very strong um, foundations, you know, in the faith community um, across the board. And, 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 you know, so we can't leave, leave them out. So I think this is, is a great model to take and look at in terms of reaching people who are members of the faith community. We also have a lot of people who are not members of the faith community. So I just feel we have to, you know, also look at how do we, again, with the layers, that's where these other community partnerships come in. Because the other thing is that people respond best 
to messaging when they get it from several different um, uh, avenues, se several different things coming at them, right? So if they're going to the community action agency for uh, heating assistance in the winter time and they're getting the message, they're going over to the urban leagues for, for work um, kind of support, you know, resume building and those kinds of other activities that they provide, if they're hearing this throughout, the, that's, that's a critical piece of this is that they have to continue to hear it from different ways, the same message. And I think that was one of the questions that was in there is that I do think there's an obligation with our national organizations, with the CDC, we all know right now, that's kind of a mess in terms of communication. Um, so, so we have to get to the point where our public health institutions because that's who's giving the information to the community as well, become that trusted um, entity for, for information. So if it's coming from public health, our local public health departments, people say, I can trust that no matter what avenue it starts going out on. That's right. That. And, and you, your comments and everybody's comments here have kind of reinforced the input that we've gotten from this study. It's- yeah really been um, very, very helpful for everybody to go into such detail and reality-based detail on what is needed. And so I thank you all um, for your well, Steve, if I could, Steve, if I could, I know that you have more discussion to go on, but uh, uh, the ministers and, and I have to attend uh, to a, another session. But as this is our tradition, when we come together, uh, we usually call on a minister to at least close our session out in prayer. So if that's okay, I, I'd like to you call too. on Reverend, Reverend DeGraff, if you would please go ahead and, and do that. Our Father and our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before your throne of grace as humbly as we know how, just to say thank you. We ask that you would continue to bless uh, every household under the sound of my voice, every organization, and every leader. Help us to march on one accord and hold high the banner. We ask that you would continue to bless these efforts and help us to feel your presence for you can do anything but fail. We ask these blessings in your precious name and the family that loves God said, amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. Thank you so much. And thank you again for inviting us. We do appreciate it. Thank you.